So let's start with where babies come from. <laughs> now I'd just like to start with something uh, kind of fun and casual. Who, okay, who has not uh, heard of Calvin and Hobbes? Oh, you haven't. I, I, I was going to say this is one, probably one of those universally uh, you know, known thing that, um, but you know, well, that's, that's why we come and learn. And now you can learn about Calvin and Hobbes. It's a really great comic strip. You, you should read it if you have a chance. And uh, well, this is one of my favorites because uh, at the end of it, Hobbes finds out that Calvin is from Taiwan. <laughs> and I am made in Taiwan. So <laughs> that's uh, where I was born. And, um, but uh, between then and now, I've lived in three different continents. Uh, so first from Taiwan, I moved to Singapore when I was very young. And then to, after you know, spending most of my kind of formative years in Singapore, I moved to US. Uh, for my college to, to study in a university, and then um, I started working for Nokia over there and uh, got transferred to Finland. So that's where I'm based currently in Finland. And uh, I've actually lived uh, more than a decade each in uh, these three countries. So uh, I won't give any more numbers. You can roughly know how I'm not young anymore, but uh, <laughs> anyway. So I've worked for um, these. Uh, few companies. Uh, well, I mean, I've done, you know, kind of internship at, in, in the university and in some, some smaller companies, but these are the major ones I worked for. And I started off as a software engineer and I've done, you know, um, everything from the technical side to the business side to um, kind of uh, process operations. So, and uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, um, Facebook, uh, diaspora, Mastodon, I'm Cybat. Uh, you can search for that. So that's something, uh, just a brief intro about me. So, okay, given that, I'm not saying like I'm fully qualified uh, to talk about true cultural diversity, but I think with some of my experiences in the different, uh, quite different cultural backgrounds, perhaps I can give some kind of um, insights or um, you know reasoning of why you might see certain things or how why is that person thinking that way and uh, you know maybe provide more understanding that way so let's look at some meanings definitions definitions to kind of frame uh, what I'm talking about here uh, this was actually last year at Red Hat Summit um, I was looking through the different talks, uh, abstracts, to find out what are interesting. And I picked out these two sessions on uh, gender diversity, both talking about uh, we women in open source. And what st struck me was like, they, were, they both seem to be quoting quite similar statistics about how, ma how many, you know, how, what's the percentage of women uh, participating in open source. But actually quite different numbers, one says 11%, uh, are uh, women participating in open source, and then one says well, only 3%. So I think, um, not saying that each one is right or wrong, but um, I wish I had a chance to go to these talks. I'm sure they will have quoted the source of where they got this information from, uh, but I was also ha having a booth to uh, look after, so I wasn't able to attend all the talks. However, I, I just want to bring to the point that um, the, the source, the context, and the definitions are usually important when you talk about numbers, data, metrics, and things like that. For example, what do you mean by participants? Is it someone who, say, come to conferences like this? Is it someone who writes code? Is it someone who um, design uh, logos and graphics? Are they all considered as participants or not? So again, like these studies and surveys, how do they define these things is very important. So since we're talking about openness, so I went to find um, some definitions about openness. So this is what I found in Wiktionary, which is like a wiki version of dictionary. And the first one is, says, accommodating attitude. So as, as in being recep receptive to new ideas, behaviors, cultures, and so on. Um, so this is like, you know, having an open mind. And then the second one is lack of secrecy, candor, transparency. So this is um, about sharing, you know, uh, sharing ideas, sharing, um, not keeping secrets. 
And then the third one is probably something we are more, more familiar with, uh, accessible viewing code, modifying computer code, so open source, open source code. So all these are you know, slightly different um, definitions, and they are all available in the wiki page, wiktionary page, which is open to modification if you're interested. So another definition of um, openness. And um, before I start this uh, time travel through my experiences, uh, I just want to um, kind of make a disclaimer, like uh, I'm not in any way saying, uh, you know, like all Singaporeans behave this way or uh, all Americans or even all Finns that I've interacted with are like that. But, you know, as with any kind of culture, uh, there are reasons or um, what people are used to that might affect the way they behave, the way they think, the way, the way they interact. So just based on my experiences and maybe you can find something interesting and learn something from it. Okay, I always lose where my, where my notes are. So a long time ago, long, long time ago, <laughs> um, this is actually my high school. Yes, we wear, we wear uniforms over there and um, and uh, this is a computer science class, so you can see very few girls. Actually, the, the, the two in the middle are teachers. They're not um, students. Uh, and they were math teachers. One was a math teacher, one was a physics teacher, I think. But anyway, so the rest of us in uniform are the um, students in this class. The teachers have, have heels, yeah. Yeah, with, with, yeah. <laughs> that's true, that's, yeah. And, and you know, we had rules about, you know, the trainers cannot be fancy colored. It has to be a certain height, and there's a lot of, yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the environment where I grew up in. And um, I mean, you know, this is uh, quite a while ago. I'm sure things might have changed. And uh, definitely, you know, this is uh, from Singapore. Things could be different in many other Asian countries. So, but what my experience is, um, as, as always, we try to be good students. And uh, uh, when I say this, sometimes I get like a reaction is, um, I, we copied each other's homework a lot. So <laughs> I know, I, I'm not saying that the teachers or anyone uh, officially encouraged it, but in, back in that time and where, where I was studying, homework or assignments uh, make up a large percentage of the, the final grade, could be like up to 30% or something. So it's not just uh, you knowing the material and uh, passing the final exams. It's, you know, they want to make sure that you are doing a lot of work to, to get that. And uh, we actually thought, you know, some of us are, some people are stronger in math, some people are stronger in physics or whatever, and uh, we can kind of share homework. We can, somebody will do, you know, whatever they're good in and, and, and then let, let the other person copy of it. And we didn't think of it as a bad thing so much because there are still the final exams or, or midterms or whatever, different kinds of uh, tests and quizzes and exams, and even if, if you copy it without understanding, you won't do well in the exam. So, you know, it's, it's still up to you to kind of understand the work and, and make sure you, you, you know, you're not just copying blindly. And also at that time, it's not uh, as easy to uh, control A, control C, control V to, you know, copy your homework. It's, it's really about, you know, writing and copying pages of stuff. So, through that, you probably will also learn something. So um, all these, like, um, it, we, were, we, were, we just really felt like it was more of a social, uh, mutual, encouraging thing rather than um, a bad thing. And there was also things like um, a classes like a literature class uh, where we studied things like uh, Shakespeare and rap poems. And at that time, uh, we were given, I was given an impression at least that there's only like one or two acceptable answers. It's not really about what you think about a certain piece of work or how you interpret it. It's like either the teacher or some, there's some kind of a model answer that you should kind of remember and just kind of reproduce that during the exams. So it's a lot of kind of an, just having that knowledge and reproducing that during the exams. So, um, Good or bad, I don't know, that's, uh, you know, arguable. But um, another thing that kind of 
uh, looking back now, uh, I, I found it quite surprising was during one of the computer science tests, I, I had something pretty close to a full grade, like a, maybe 98% out of 100. And then when the teacher gave out like the um, sample solution, he actually just took my exam paper and then made a copy and gave it out to everyone. You know, now thinking back, I'm like, he didn't even ask for my permission. But at that time, it was like, wow, he, he, he did that. Because when we were at, at that environment, it's like you, you usually copy things from people you respect because they have the knowledge, they have the um, understanding, they are, they are the expert in that area. So again, that's good. I'm not trying to make excuses for my copying stuff, but you know, that was how we, we kind of understood things. That was how, uh, our world. Um, growing up in that school environment. All right, and then I moved to the US uh, for my undergraduate studies in computer science. And uh, well, if, besides the computer science classes I had to attend, you know, like uh, Texas history, I was in Dallas, Texas, by the way, and uh, government and things like that, things that um, was like totally new to me and I was really scared, and um, but you know, like back in Singapore, it's like if I just went home and studied the material and did, did my exams, I will, you know, get a good grade and pass. But in the U.S., I was like looking at the kind of course uh, syllabus, and it said 20% um, of the grade class participation. It's like, oh my goodness, like what? And the, the, that's not even the most shocking thing. The next thing was like in class people just kind of um, are encouraged to uh, voice their opinions very loudly, um, sometimes interrupting the teacher and disagreeing with the teacher. I'm like, oh my God, mind blown. This actually is possible. You know, like uh, there was a huge uh, culture shock to me in the first couple of years when I was studying in the US. And so, um, yeah, I, I was thinking to myself, these people are really rude. But now I come to understand this is how they were kind of uh, brought up in their education system to be, you know, uh, outspoken, to voice their own opinion. It doesn't have to be, and usually they are encouraged not to have the same opinion. It's like, you know, um, it's quite different. So, so that, that was just a, uh, in some meetup in the, San Francisco area, and it's, you know, it's very common to just have people kind of gathering together and sharing ideas and things like that. And um, then, then I compared to, well, this is of course fictional, but um, it's, it's like it's, we, we need more um, people who are eager to uh, participate, but we don't, I mean, like, do we have to have people to ask permission? I guess it depends on what kind of permission you're, you're, you're uh, looking for. But um, th that was kind of my idea of how participation was like growing up. I have to raise my hand, get, okay, you can answer now, and then speak my mind. And usually try to not antagonize the teacher or something. So quite, quite a different um, mindset, at least. And then I moved to Finland uh, after somehow graduating with my <laughs> computer science degree. I, I, so, by the way, I did badly for all those general courses. I only excelled in my uh, technical <laughs> math and computer science classes because those are the things I understand and, you know, it fits my mode of thinking. But, and then I moved to a place where nobody talked. Well, that's not, <laughs> that's not true, but um, you know, it takes a while for Finns, <laughs> for Finns to warm up. And, um, but I, I noticed that it doesn't mean that they, don't, they are not social or they, they don't come together and help each other out. So there's this thing called Daugot, which uh, in Finland, it means kind of people coming together with a common cause, with a common um, goal in mind, and uh, just kind of help each other out. Okay, and um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I was looking for, communal work, like coming together, do something for the greater good of the community or for the, of the um, uh, uh, society or city or whatever. They may not talk much, but they share in the effort. And so like, um, 
I was trying to update the slides because I've given a similar talk before. So this is a slide from, this is a picture from just early this week. So this is my kind of one of my understanding of why people don't talk so much. You, you spend too much energy trying to keep warm. <laughs> you don't want to waste, waste your energy on small talk. And you, I mean, even the ducks, I, I, I don't know why um, they are all on the snow because I think the water is probably warmer at this point. But, uh, you know, maybe they are sharing body heat or something. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, sauna is huge in Finland. It's, it's really a, about that. And you don't have to talk much. You can still kind of share that moment together. So, um, yeah, a another one which I, I saw an article recently, which Later, I found out it's actually two years ago, but um, it t talked about like the friendly countries ranked. I think they ranked about 60 countries, and the first is uh, Costa Rica, and Finland is like I don't know 59 or something, <laughs> and um, even Czech Republic is like 40, 45, I think. So, but the thing is, I went to Ch Costa Rica for a vacation, a couple of weeks. People were friendly, you know, they made me feel, feel welcome and everything, people were nice to talk to, but I didn't get, none of, you know, nobody got my contact to stay in, uh, in touch or anything, so I can't say I have a friend from Costa Rica. So, but I have a lot of friends in Finland and in Czech Republic. So, you know, a, a thing about statistics and information and things like that, it can be taken as like a um, kind of broad view of things, but definitely not you know, the definition of what people are like from each of these countries. So, and I definitely encourage um, people to, to, I say WTF, welcome to Finland, and learn about the people and the culture who is really, really lovely. <laughs> and I'm ha happy to be their ambassador. If they are not willing to talk, I'll, I'll talk for them. <laughs> so, all right, I got lost. Where are my Finnish ducks? Okay. Okay, so, and, and also this map is really bad. I mean, like, I, I grew up in Singapore, which is like, what, here? Uh, and, and that's like, it's supposed to be above the equator, but that's like, you know, two-thirds of the way down. So totally inaccurate. Ignore this. I just wanted to up, like, update my slides. <laughs> so, okay, so like my first third of my life, I was like open sourcing my homework. The second part of my life, we open source opinions and you know, ideas and things like that. And the third part, um, kind of in Finland, open sourcing, I guess, effort and um, kind of uh, working together, um, body heat, whatever. <laughs> so uh, not saying that that's the only thing people share and be open about in those areas, but it's kind of the um, uh, emphasis so I actually kind of saw all this coming together for me when I was more involved in open source projects, which is really cool because, well, first of all, all these, a lot of these huge events are, uh, not, if not entirely, very much majority volunteer driven. So here you have the coming together of, you know, doing work together, uh, sharing effort. So that was from my first FOSS in 2013. I'll be going for my sixth or seventh next week. I hope to see some of you there. Uh, FOSS Asia, also really uh, huge event. I went first time two years ago. I'm going again this year. And of course, DEF CON, my th third one, and uh, really enjoying it. So, you know, uh, so there's this, this whole effort coming together. There is also definitely a sharing of so-called homework, which means like for example, uh, we share things like the process of if somebody has experience in organizing an event, I always you know, can, can refer to uh, get, get information from the person, how do you do it? And you know, sharing like the code of conduct and of course with the proper creative commons or license in place, you can you know, make use of that. And also there's also the sharing of opinions because we all know open source community is very opinionated. We have a lot of strong opinions, good opinions, and I think we are not afraid to have the differing opinions, but still kind of work together to either resolve it or uh, come to kind of some kind of a conclusion. I think it's one of the reasons why we have, say, different distros or different kind of uh, versions of software doing similar tasks. But um, that's not necessarily a bad thing because with open source, we can do that. You know, we're not restricted by uh, proprietary or uh, private or uh, any other kind of restrictive um, 
uh, processes and licenses to you know, have that uh, openness to be able to do that. So, all right, I think I have only a few minutes left. Um, talking about communication and culture, a lot of times, especially in such a diverse um, conferences or, or, or communities, English may not be the first language for a lot of people. Actually, for me, I would like to say that music is my first language. I've, all, I've played in orchestras and bands from, from since I was, before I was able to speak, I think. So, like, I, I'm in Finland, I play in an orchestra. I don't speak much Finnish, but I can still kind of make music with the people because that's the common kind of understanding. So, um, and, and things like uh, languages evolve uh, through time as well. Like this tweet said, you know, somebody saw the concerto in F hashtag because they thought the, uh, hash, the sharp sign is hashtag. So, uh, you know, like I think the, 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 the key is to re just kind of uh, share and explain, you know, it's not hashtag, it's something else, but you know, if you don't explain it, people might have the misunderstanding. So, so uh, as we talk about communication tools, uh, a lot of times I find uh, communities having a hard time deciding, you know, which tool is the best. Should we stick to IRC? Should we use Slack? Because everyone else is using Slack now. I mean, of course, you want to find the best fit tool for your community. Uh, is it where most people are and where they are comfortable at? Uh, that's important. But um, I, I would say, like, don't sweat it too much. I mean, each tool has pros and cons. I'm sure that, that that's one that kind of majority people like it. And then what, what is good uh, is important also is to provide some alternatives because there are people who, you know, just can not use to IRC. And that's fine. You know, it, is, it doesn't, it's an, I've, I've used it forever, so I'm comfortable with it, but I understand that everyone is. So, you know, provide alternatives, other means of uh, reaching out. Uh, events and face-to-face -face is always a great um, way to do that. So, uh, focus on the communication. Uh, there's this two-way thing, you know, we talk about sharing, we talk about being receptive to open ideas. So, it's definitely not just one or the other, it's, you know, listen. So, receiving, speak, sharing, and repeat. And I say use... Um, Broken English with pride because I believe that broken English is the, is the most spoken English type of English in the world, and I don't have a source for that, but it's just based on, on my observation. So, <laughs> so and to just conclude, um, there's really no secret to understanding different cultures. There's really just being aware and and talk to people, understand, you know. Why, why do you think that way, or, or what, what um, makes influence your decision, and things like that. And so be, be kind of, um, be open uh, to, to sharing your, your views as well, and, and be receptive to other people. And uh, I conclude with a little tit, uh, tidbit from my dad. As I, I talk with him a lot about uh, what I do at work, and, and I was doing this uh, presentation uh, last year, and, and he just kind of thought a bit and said, hmm, openness enables connectivity for cultural diversity, which is so true, true because, I mean, he's, I, I'm already not young, and he's a lot older, so, sorry that, but it's true, and, um, and also for him to, to see, like, he, I think initially he didn't understand, like, why are we, you know, sharing our whole lives on social media and blogs and whatever, but no, he was open to the idea that, you know, this is kind of how people change with the times. And he discovers that, you know, because we, uh, also we live in different countries, that me sharing stuff means he has access to what I'm doing day to day in my life and things like that. And he's learned to appreciate that. So, you know, um, openness um, in, in, in the best sense is really very en en enabling and powerful for, for um, not just open source communities, but our lives as a whole. And I think uh, my time is up, so <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, 
I put um, the mascot for Manage IQ here, who his name is George. Uh, who, uh, I have a, a Manage IQ booth, which is between the pulp and the RDO booths in, in the area. And uh, welcome to, um, because I think uh, we're, we're short on time, so welcome to talk to me there, ask your questions, and, and get some stickers, some swag. So thank you.